6 p.m. on Wall Street as we continue our special coverage. Donald Trump uh, being indicted today in Washington on federal charges over his efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Brian? Yeah, these charges include conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of and an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding and conspiracy against the right to vote and have that vote counted. That's all according to the indictment that was filed. We go to Ed Baxter. Ed? All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, you went over the uh, the charges. Um, he is uh, also, we are finding out, uh, going to be um, appearing or is ordered to appear uh, before the court on Thursday the 3rd. So that is, uh, that is a day after tomorrow, uh, U.S. And uh, whether he is asked to enter a plea at that time, uh, we don't know, but but that is where it will, uh, that's where it will go. Let's find out a little bit more. Uh, we're joined by uh, Bloomberg's June Grasso of uh, Bloomberg Law. Uh, June, let, let's go, Brian briefly mentioned the counts. Let's let's go through them if we can. I know that you're just getting them and reading them, 45 pages, but let's start with, with count one. Uh, th- this is this is basically effort to overturn the election. This is, this is really the broad one, right? So the, I have to say that these counts, we sort of were familiar with them because they were mentioned in that target letter that President Trump got. So we sort of have some background on them. The conspiracy to defraud the United States, this is really about the fake electors charge, Um, you know, the schemes and the tactics that he used. And what's really interesting in this, it's a speaking indictment. So there's a lot of information in there. And a lot of it people will have heard of. So they go through in this indictment, five different states, Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and they talk about what happened in each of those states. So people will be familiar with some of the things. For example, it mentions that phone call that we've all heard a million times probably, where he's talking to Brad Raffensperger about finding 11,000, et cetera, votes. So, So you'll see a lot of things that you'll recognize. What's also interesting is that he's the only one charged. There are six other co-conspirators that are not meant that are not named. However, you can also tell who some of them are. It's pretty obvious that Rudy Giuliani is one of them and some of the other attorneys that were, you know, involved in the efforts to change the results of the election. So that one, a federal judge actually already found by a preponderance of the evidence that Trump and a co-conspirator at that time it was John Eastman he's also one of the co-conspirators here likely violated this conspiracy to fraud the US which is a very broad statute Okay, so, and we're standing by, by the way, for a press conference uh, with Jack Smith. Apparently, he is going to speak. June, I, I want to follow, though, because of the, the second count is interfering uh, with the process of certifying. So that that is going really to the heart of obstructing the, um, the certification of a vote, which would lead to the transfer of power. So this, again, is Section 1512 of Title 18 has been used many, many times, perhaps hundreds of times, against January 6th rioter. It's the Justice Department's go-to count in describing the central event of that day, which was the disruption of the Electoral College certification process that was taking place inside the Capitol. So that is, you know, fairly expected. And they go through, I mean, every detail that you can imagine about what happened that day and what former President Trump said, including, you know, what we've all seen, which is was his uh, his speech to the crowd there and telling them to march on the Capitol. June, from what we've heard from Trump's lawyers, John Lauro and Todd Blanche, uh, is the main line of defense political persecution? And then just a quick follow to that is, what's the reason from a legal standpoint that the uh, alleged co-conspirators have not been officially named? Well, the reason may be that the special counsel really wants to move this to trial fast. So where you have one defendant, it's much easier uh, to move it to trial fast. I mean, that doesn't mean that... In other words, since they haven't named the co-conspirators, they can still file charges against them, you know, at another time. So that doesn't mean that the co-conspirators are free and clear. I know that, you know, Rudy Giuliani had told reporters that he wasn't being, you know, they weren't, he didn't get a target letter. He wasn't being indicted. He should say at this time, because you never know what will happen in the future. And I think it's kind of unlikely that they're going to let these co-conspirators, you know, get off 
just free and clear. Um, And as far as what we've heard from former President Trump and his lawyers is this is, you know, political prosecution, the witch hunt, which we've heard since even before he became president, that's not going to fly so well in uh, in a courtroom. A judge probably won't even let them raise that. And Trump has also said that he's going to raise the uh, that the election was stolen from him. And I'm sure a judge is not going to let him raise that either because it's been proven in courtrooms, I forget how many, time and time again, that the election was fair and free and was not stolen from him. Some of the other things he could raise, advice of counsel is something that's been talked about. But there again, you have to have a specific counsel that advised you. And, you know, you have to have, there's a thing called, um, you have to, you can't just accept what's said by somebody. You can't accept something if it's reckless disregard for the truth. So, I mean, he's going to have a lot more restrictions on his defense than those that he or his attorneys throw around, you know, when they're doing interviews. It's going to be a lot different in a courtroom. Now, you mentioned, uh, June, that uh, just looking at Georgia and other states, this is going to parallel what is going on with a potential indictment uh, in, in Georgia, doesn't it? I didn't realize it was going to be this wide ranging. It is it is very much a circle, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, they're covering. I, I, I was surprised that I mean, we had heard that you know they were definitely looking into Georgia. They had talked to the Georgia election officials and secretary of state, et cetera. And we knew that it was, you know, Michigan, there was talk that they had talked to electors, et cetera, in Michigan. But it it really is broad because it goes to Pennsylvania, it goes to Arizona, it goes to Wisconsin. And those are states where I don't think we have heard as much about the electors in, you know, in reporting. So it's it shows you how how they really have investigated this and they really have their facts down. I mean, you could read this and it's sort of like reading a book. You you know, you you don't have to and sometimes in indictments you have to like wonder and you look like what did they mean? This is so clearly set out. It's called a, a speaking indictment. It's the, similar to the one that we had in the classified documents case, although there are no pictures in this one. Um, but it's, it's It's very easy to read, and I think, you know, last time we heard Jack Smith say that he urged Americans to read the indictment, and I think that's another thing that they'll probably be hoping that Americans do to see, you know, where this all came from, and also why Donald Trump is being charged. Also, you know, they have used that, um, that civil rights era law for deprivation, excuse me, deprivation of rights, Section 241 of Title uh, 18. And that was a surprise when it came out in the Target letter. Um, It's been used broadly, though, in the modern era with cases of voting fraud conspiracies. So um, that also is, was not a surprise, but it was a surprise when we heard the Target letter, but not so much this, because this follows along with what we anticipated. Yeah, and uh, and hang in there, uh, June, will you? Brian, did you have something else to, to ask June? Well, it's kind of a long type of question. I don't know if we can sneak it in, but it has to do whether or not this continues in the public arena, which the former president seems to love, or, you know, listening to former prosecutors and defense lawyers. Uh, normally, they say once you are facing actually doing time in prison, uh, that you get very careful about what you say in public. Is well, that going to be the case this time around? Well, I don't think Donald Trump is prone to being careful about what he says in public. I mean, he's talking about this on the campaign trail. He continues to call the special counsel deranged. But if you'll remember, when he was in New York for his for his arraignment on those charges, the judge very sternly instructed him not to say anything. And I don't think he's really been talking that much about that particular uh, proceeding. But I think that he may, even though his lawyers will tell him not to, they'll tell him don't say anything because it could always be used against you. I think that Donald Trump being Donald Trump, he's probably going to continue to talk about it. Hey, June, thank you. And uh, stand by for us. Uh, I know you will. And uh, you know, this will be a topic for Bloomberg Law uh, tonight. Uh, that is Bloomberg's uh, uh, legal correspondent, uh, June Grasso. Uh, we want to just switch gears a little bit um, and uh, get with Jeannie Shanzano, professor of Bloomberg politics, contributor, author of American Democracy in Crisis. So here it is, Jeannie. This is history. 
Th- this this is, um, you know, I think it's really striking as we just take a step back and to think that this is the first former president to be charged with trying to steal an election and to impact and disrupt the peaceful transfer of power, which we have had in this country since 1800, when John Adams handed it over to Thomas Jefferson, somebody he detested from another party. Um, it, so it is quite a an indictment. And I obviously, like everybody else, and I was just listening to all of June's details. I don't know how she does it so fast, but trying to read through this and somebody described it as a screaming indictment, not a speaking indictment. And I think that is an apt description because it is chock full of details of information. And it is quite compelling to read what they have laid out here in these four counts against him. All right. So so now politically, um, Brian asked a really good question of June, and I want to ask the same thing of you. I mean, how? well, let me let me try to rephrase. No, I won't. I'll, what's in my head? Uh, how do you tell Donald Trump to shut up when it's uh, when it's against his uh, his legal, um, you know, probably responsibility to do so? What, how, how do you do that? And will he and politically can he? Well, he won't because we already understand he has already and not surprisingly sent out a fundraising appeal as this has come down saying that this is the Biden administration's attempt to try to block his campaign because the polls that we've been talking about for the last two days and last several weeks, quite frankly, show that he is so far ahead. So he is not being silenced. And obviously, all of us who who support the First Amendment, as I know all of you do, we don't want him to be, uh, you know, sort of quiet in that way or to be shut up. And it's, I think, one of the really interesting things in this indictment is that Jack Smith says very, very clearly, he can go out and he can say untruths. He can lie to the American people. He can lie to the press. He can go on the ellipse and he can say myths, truths. But he's not being charged with any of that. He's being charged with using the power or attempting to use the power of his office and the power of the government to steal an election and to overturn the will of the American people. And Mm. so, you know, you can we can have both, in other words. And I think it's such an important point that you both raise. We can have freedom of speech freedom of press, First Amendment rights, and we can also have fair, transparent elections that are uninterrupted. And that is how it should be in a democracy like the United States. And that's why I was really, really, you know, happy in the very quick reading I've done to see Jack Smith lay that out. You can lie, but you can't steal. And that is the reality. 